Okay, so uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to um, your lesson on day two. And this is cohort A I'm talking to. Um, yeah, listen, there was a couple of questions in the homework uh, on day one that um, we just didn't get around to talking about yesterday. So I apologize for that. That was, in case you're wondering, that is the last two questions on the ones right here on page 214. So let me first take care of those, okay? They're, they're a little strange, so let me get to those questions. And if some of you have been asking questions on, uh, on Slack, that's perfect. I like seeing that. And sometimes I'm busy at home and I, I won't get to it right away, but I'll always get to it. So if you wanna help each other out and answer the question, if you have an answer and you explain it, you know, before I get to it, wonderful. Uh, otherwise, sometimes you'll have to wait if I'm having dinner or got something with the family going, whatever it is. Just be patient and sometimes I'm on it right away and sometimes it takes a little time. So as long as you understand, we understand each other, that's good. Okay, so page 214, we'll get to that in a second. Before I, we get to it, let me show you, okay? So here in OneNote, there's something about waves, okay? That's called boundary behavior. What happens when waves hit a boundary? So I'm gonna show you a couple of animations. So let's start with this one here. Okay, so here we have a wave, it's coming in and it is hitting a, um, I'm just gonna fix this a little, yeah. Okay, and it's hitting a wall. Now it's, it's hitting a fixed barrier, we call it, okay? So there's this barrier and what happens is, and you'll notice right away, and what I'm gonna try to do is use the annotation feature. Okay, so let's see if I can do this. What's happening is, the wave, the incident wave, we call it, is coming in in this direction. And then it bounces off and there's a reflection that takes place, okay, off of the barrier. And then there's a pulse that goes back in the opposite direction. Now, what you notice right away is that the pulse changes when it hits the barrier. It comes in like a crest. So here we have an incident crest. But when it bounces off, it bounces off like a trough, okay? And so we call this a phase inversion, okay? Phase, a crest and a trough are opposite phases. So crest is when the particles go up, the trough is when they go down, okay? So we use this term called phase to describe that. And so here we have a particle, or sorry, the crest gets inverted. And so we call this a phase inversion. So now I'm going to actually close that. I'm gonna go back to one note. So this, when waves bounce off of, sorry, it's not working right. When they bounce off of a hard boundary, so this is like bouncing off of a wall. Um, when they reflect off of a hard boundary, you get what's called a phase inversion. In just a second, let me delete those annotations I made. Okay, and uh, that's it. So there's a phase inversion. So that happens whenever a wave bounces off a hard boundary, a crest becomes a trough. Now, I'm not gonna show you this animation, but a trough would also become a, a crest. So if a trough were to come in, it would also get inverted and become a crest when it bounced off. So whenever waves hit what's called a hard boundary, okay, like a solid wall kind of thing is a hard boundary, they get inverted when they bounce off. Now, sound waves do that. You can't really tell because for your ear, a compression and a rarefaction sound the same but compressions do bounce off and become rarefactions when they bounce off walls, okay? And a rarefaction becomes a compression, same thing. So that's called a phase inversion, phase inversion, pardon me. All right, now there is such a thing as a soft boundary. Sometimes we call this free end reflection. Okay, now you're not hitting a wall exactly. What's happening, in it, what's happening here is the wave is traveling down the string but this time the end of the string is free to move up and down. It's like a loose end, okay? Sometimes we call it a free end, soft boundary, or sometimes we call it free end, okay? So the end of the string is free to move up and down, okay? And you can see that that's what it does. Well, you still get a reflection, but this time the phase is not inverted. A crest stays a crest, okay? So that is called a soft boundary reflection or a free end reflection. So, um, okay, 
a good example of this, when light is traveling through air and hits glass, it bounces off. So you get some reflection off the glass. That's a hard boundary. Okay, now light also can travel through glass. So when light is traveling through a block of glass and then it actually exits the glass, like it's gonna hit a boundary of air, we call that a soft boundary because you're in something thick and you're going into something thinner like air. So you're in something that's dense and you're going to something less dense. And when you bounce off something less dense, it's like a soft boundary. And this time the waves do not get inverted in that case. Okay, so this is called soft boundary reflection. And so we see the difference between a hard and a soft boundary here. I'll put them both here on the screen together. In a hard boundary, the wave turns upside down. Sometimes we call the hard boundary a fixed end reflection, fixed end, because the end is not free to move this time. And the soft boundary is called a free end reflection. And you can see that in both cases, you get a reflection. The wave does bounce off, but in a hard boundary, it bounces off upside down. So it gets inverted. And in the soft boundary, it stays. It does not lose its phase. So that's called a soft boundary reflection. All right. So now there's a question on page 214 that talks about this, but watch what happens when you join two pieces of rope together, okay? And here we have a wave traveling in a thin rope and it hits a thicker rope. Now what happens there, okay, is here, and I'm gonna turn on my annotations again. It's gonna repeat several times. So just keep your eye on that. Okay, so here comes the incident crest. It's coming in that direction. Okay, and what you'll notice is there's a crest that passes into the new medium and moves slower in the new medium because the new medium is heavier. Okay, so the crest keeps going, part of the crest and at least keeps going straight. We call that the transmitted wave. Okay, that's the transmission into the new medium. Okay, now there, there's also a reflection that is bouncing off of the, you know, spot here, like at that spot that I just dotted there, the blue dot, that is the boundary between the two media that is called an interface between the two ropes in this case. Okay, the point where they're connected. So part of the wave energy bounces off that heavier rope. And because the rope is heavier, because the dark rope is dense, denser, okay, and slower. As a result, waves move slower through it. Then what happens is that's like hitting a hard boundary. And now you get a phase inversion. Because it's like a hard boundary. Okay, where the wave hits the heavy string. Hitting something heavy is like hitting a hard boundary. Okay, like you're the little, let's say you're a little skinny rope there and you bounce off of the, the thick rope. Well, that's like hitting like a wall kind of. And so that's why the reflection gets inverted. Now the reflection is a lot weaker than the incoming transmitted wave. That's because the wave energy is being split up. Some of it goes through, some of it gets transmitted and some of it bounces off or reflects, okay? So when waves do this, when a wave approaches a new medium, it, you get partial reflection and partial transmission. And think of it like this. Let's say you're looking at light bouncing off glass. Well, some light will go through the glass, but you can also see your reflection in the glass, right? So you can see at the same time as you see through it, you can also see your face reflected in it. So you get partial reflection and partial transmission in a block of glass or a pane of glass in a window. And uh, that is also a hard boundary for the light. So the light bouncing off gets inverted. Now your eyes can't tell that it's inverted because crescent troughs for light look the same to your eyes. So they don't look different, um, but they are inverted actually. Okay. And uh, there's actually ways we can show that they're inverted that, you know, that we look at in grade 12, but not in grade nine. Okay. When we do a unit on light, the wave theory on light, which is kind of interesting. It's not on sound, but it's on light instead. All right, so we're not gonna be talking about light, so we won't get too uh, into that, but it's kind of neat to think about in terms of light, because light does this, it partially reflects and transmits through a block of glass, let's say. 
and the waves actually propagate like this. Okay, so that is scenario number one. Now I'm going to erase my annotations because they won't scroll with this. So I'm going to clear the annotations and then I'm going to close my annotation window and I'm going to scroll down to the next example here. All right, so now you know what happens when you get that scenario. Well, what if we turn that scenario around? In other words, let's, let's switch things up a little here. Now what's gonna happen is we'll put the heavier rope, okay, on the uh, right side, on the left side, pardon me. So here comes the incident crest. Okay, now we're seeing the reflection here in the transmission. You do get a transmission into the lighter string, but the lighter string, because it's lighter, it's like a soft boundary, okay? And so that reflection, whoops, the reflection is not inverted. Notice it stays a crest. So when waves are in something heavy and they bounce off something light, it's like a free end reflection or a soft boundary reflection. And so the reflection does not get inverted this time. Now the transmission never changes. Notice it's always a crest. So here we see a crest coming in and a crest keeps going off here to the right. Okay, and it just keeps going that way. And that's exactly what we expect. Okay, the crest will not change. The transmitted wave always has the same identity as the incident wave, okay? So we call this the incident pulse. Incident means it's incoming, here it comes, right? Like if I throw a ball at you, the ball is incident on you, like it's, it's approaching you. So here's the approaching wave, the incident wave. When it strikes the boundary, okay? And the boundary is right here. When it strikes the boundary, part of the wave goes through, it transmits, stays a crest when it transmits, but when it bounces off, this time it does not turn upside down. So the reflection is not inverted. All right, I'm gonna erase these annotations again. Whoops. And let's scroll up and let's look at both scenarios together. So you see the difference between these two scenarios. Really the key difference is that when you start off and the incident pulse is in something light and it bounces off something heavy, it does turn upside down, okay? Because hitting something heavy is like a hard boundary, okay? And that's why I wrote here, a heavy string is a hard boundary. And because it's a hard boundary, the reflection is inverted, right? The crest turns into a trough when it bounces off. Now the transmission never changes, it stays a crest. So whatever makes it through into the heavy rope, that will stay, its, its identity won't change, it'll stay a crest. Now the opposite is true. If you start in something heavy and you're bouncing off something light, well, that's like hitting a soft boundary, right? And when you hit a soft boundary, you do not get a phase inversion. All right, so that is the key difference. Now, what I'm gonna do is, and you can see me do this, I'm gonna go to your homework questions. Whoops, not Netflix. That's not what I wanted to go to. I meant to go to your PDF file here. Okay, and uh, actually th those questions on page 214, let's now together take a look at those questions, see if you, we can make sense of them, okay? Oops, I might wanna type in the page number properly. 214, wow, okay, I get it. You're being a pest, you're still being a pest. So I will delete all the numbers, 214. Okay, so here's the questions on page 214. Now that armed with this new information about hard and soft boundary reflections, now I'm going to copy this question. So I'm gonna make a new thing. I'm gonna copy both of these questions over onto our page, okay, in OneNote. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna paste those questions right here. Okay, that's not where I wanted them, but Okay, let's see if it'll cooperate with me. Of course not. Okay, so I need to attach my keyboard. I'm sorry, just give me a second. The joy is uh, teaching from a computer. All right. 
So let me just move this so it's a little more out of the way. Okay, that's good enough. All right. So now what it says is, now, by the way, when it's more dense, okay, when you're entering, when you're hitting a heavy string, heavy is slower, okay? So notice how the wave moves much slower in the darker and heavier string. So here comes the incident wave and the transmitted wave is actually moving quite a bit slower than it is in the, uh, than it is in the incident lighter string, okay? Now here it's speeding up, right? So it's bouncing off a lighter medium is faster for the waves. And so the crest actually speeds up as it enters the new medium here and starts going faster in the lighter string. Okay, now keep that in mind. Now let's look at these questions. All right, so here's the deal. It says, copy this page into your notebook. Well, done, okay. <laughs> I did that, so I copied it into my notebook. And now let's do it together, okay? So it says, table one, an incident pulse is plus. Now plus means a crest, okay? Minus means a trough. So keep that in mind. Now, what they're saying is, if it's like these scenarios here, okay? So the, it's fast and slow media, right? Fast and slow medium or heavy, okay? Heavy is slow, okay? And fast is lighter. Okay, so keep that in mind to, just so we can read the question properly. Okay, so what they're saying is, if the crest is going from fast to slow, so here, here you see where it says that? If it's going from fast to slow, what scenario is that? Well, that is scenario number one. Okay, and if it lets me scroll, that'd be nice. So that's this scenario right here. It's going from fast and entering a slow medium, right? So over here, whoops, over here, it's fast, okay? And then over here, it's slow. And you tell me what's happening here. So the reflection turns into a trough. The crest turns into a trough because it's like hitting a hard boundary. So a plus turns into a minus, right? But the transmitter wave stays a crest. It stays a plus, okay? Now, let's go back to the question. Let's see if we can figure it out. So if you're going fast to slow, what we see is that the transmitted pulse does not change. It stays a plus. It stays a crest. But the reflected one switches. It becomes minus or a trough. And that's your book's weird way of writing crest and trough is plus or minus. Okay. Now that's if you're going from fast to slow. Okay. So when you go from fast to slow, it's the reflection. It's the reflection that tells you what's changing, okay? So we look at the reflection will help us understand what kind of change takes place, okay? So when you go from fast to slow, it's like hitting a hard boundary. And so you get an inversion here, okay? Now let's look at the next line in the table. So this is scenario number one. Let's look at scenario number two. So again, we have a crest coming in and it turned into a trough. So the trust turned into a trough, okay? And that's a phase inversion. So if the reflection changed, well, again, that means it has to be fast to slow. It has to be the same as the first row, right? So it's very simple. Now, here's the thing. The transmitted one never changes. This always is the same as the incident. Okay, it has to be the same. It never changes when it transmits. So now keep that in mind. Let's look at our last case. So case three, this time we start off as a trough, but this time you're not going fast to slow, but you're going slow to fast. Now, slow to fast is scenario number two. Here's a slow pulse or a, slow, a, a pulse in a slow medium. This time the phase does not change. So a crest stays a crest. We don't show it in this animation, but a trough would also stay a trough, right? Okay, 
So let's go back to our table. So if it's slow to fast, you do not get a phase inversion. So this will stay a trough, okay? Now, the transmitted one never changes its identity. So that's also a trough. So here on the last row, it's all troughs. Now, by the way, uh, I forgot to fill in this box here. So in case number two, the transmitted pulse must be the same as the incident pulse. So it's also a crest, okay? All right, so you get the idea? That's how you do question one. So there, we did it together. Now look at question two. Okay, you have three ropes, A, B, and C. They're made of different materials attached to one another, like in our pictures, okay, in our animations that I've been showing you today. Ropes A, B, and C, classify them as fast, medium, and intermediate, okay? So which one's the heaviest? Which one's the lightest and which one's in between? Okay, which one's the slowest? Which one's the intermediate and which one's the fastest? Okay. Now, a positive pulse in A is reflected as a positive pulse and is transmitted as a positive pulse into B. Now, we can ignore the transmission because, of course, that's never going to change. If they told us that it changed on transmission, there's something wrong because that's not true. So, this we don't care what happens to the transmission, we're looking at what happens to the reflection. So if it stays a positive pulse, that means it must have been a free end reflection. So that means that rope A, here, let's make rope A. This is rope A, okay? And it's attached to rope B. So B would have to be thinner than A. And what I mean by that is if that's A and that's B, what's happening here is because the positive pulse stayed a positive pulse when it reflected, therefore, this is slower and this is faster, okay? Now, it's the reflection that tells us. So if there's no phase inversion, there's no inversion, that's how we know there was no inversion when the wave passed, reflected from A back into A, okay? When it bounced off B, it didn't get inverted. That means B has to be like a soft boundary. It has to be lighter, okay? Less dense and lighter and faster, okay? The waves go faster through it. Now, what about C? Well, C, if we keep reading, it says here a positive pulse in B is also reflected as a positive pulse. And again, we can ignore this. We can ignore that, okay? Because we don't care about the transmission. It never changes. It doesn't tell us anything, okay? So what I'm saying is here we attach rope C, okay? So there's rope C. This must be the fastest one. It has to be even faster than B. And the reason why is because, again, we had no phase inversion when a wave from B bounced off C. So that means C has to be faster than B, okay? And therefore, this is A is slower, B is intermediate. Okay, and C has to be the fastest. Okay, and that's it. So it's really all about these animations. That's what's really happening. Now your textbook tries to explain it. So you could read the book, but the animations that I'm showing you here on OneNote are more helpful, okay? All right, so now that we've seen this, let's talk about something else. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually cut this lesson a little bit shorter than I was going to in the first place, but I'll explain. So there's one more page I'd like to look at. Okay, it's got lots of animations on it. Um, let's talk about all the properties of waves that we know about. Okay, so there are several. So we're going to end with my favorite one, but let's start with something simple, reflection. So we just talked about reflection, right? We've seen how waves bounce off hard and soft boundaries. So let's just take a look at how water waves might do that, or in this case, a ray of light. Oh, here, let me fix that for you. Okay, so look. Here's the deal. 
when a wave, when a ray of light hits a mirror, it bounces off in such a way that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So this is a famous principle, okay? Waves do it too, we call it the law of reflection. So when waves hit a boundary, they will bounce off. So this is like a two-dimensional reflection. Pardon me, I know I'm yawning. <laughs> Past my bedtime. Here at 8 p.m., okay, the night before. But anyway, the angle of incidence. Now you notice how they measure it. And I just wanna point this out to you. We measure angles with a protractor normally. Okay, and uh, please in your textbook, whenever they ask you like, what is the wavelength and they expect you to measure it, you know what they mean. As long as you understand what the wavelength is, you can measure it on your screen. I don't really care. I know if you actually had a paper copy of the textbook, you'd all get the same answer, but don't worry about that when they ask you to make measurements of that kind. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is just do a little annotation here. Let me zoom in on this picture first. Okay, so this is the law of reflection. Okay, so here we have a ray, a ray of light coming in. Now the normal here that they show, it's gonna disappear when the animation repeats itself. So that normal line is an imaginary line that is perpendicular, okay, to the mirror itself or to the wall, if you like. Now we measure the angles. The word normal, by the way, means perpendicular, okay, in science. So this word normal, that's why we call it normal. It means perpendicular, perpendicular in this case to the surface that you're bouncing off of. Now we measure the angle of incidence. I'm going to call it theta i. The angle of incidence is measured there on the top and the angle of reflection, I'll call it theta r. These two things must be equal, okay? And that is the law of reflection. It's a law because waves always do it, okay? So now Oh, oops, I did not mean to do that. So let me clear these drawings. Let me close my annotations. Now let's go over here. Uh, water waves do it too. So water, water waves can hit a barrier. So here, take a look at this. Here's some water waves, they're striking a boundary. And if you look closely, they bounce off the bottom where there's a wall that you don't see there, but there's a wall and they will travel off, but they also obey the law of reflection. Okay, so watch again, here come the incident waves, they hit the boundary, they bounce off, and they obey the law of reflection. So it's a little bit harder to see, okay, because of the way the waves look in the water. But you see light, we don't see the waves, we only see the rays of light. And so what they do at the end is they draw the waves for you, like the rays, okay? And the two angles, they label them alpha and beta, they'd be equal to each other. Okay, these two angles, and that's the law of reflection. Okay, so I'm just gonna summarize it for you in this little picture here. So when light or waves or sound, anything hits a boundary, doesn't matter what kind of boundary, hard or soft, when they bounce off, they obey the law of reflection, which means these two angles that we've indicated with the Greek letters, theta I and theta R, okay? And this is measured from what's called a normal line, which is perpendicular to your surface here at the bottom. So that dotted line is just this imaginary line perpendicular to the surface. We measure our angles from there. The two angles are equal, okay? And that in the box is called the law of reflection, that these two angles must be equal. Now, if you throw a ball against the wall, basically it obeys the same law, okay? So not only waves, but particles too, when they bounce off walls, they obey this law. It's a very simple principle. All right, so now let's look at the next thing. The next thing is cool. Um, have you ever noticed you can hear sound around a corner? Okay, well, that's due to a phenomenon called diffraction. So this is diffraction. So here we see waves, okay? They're approaching here on one side, they're straight waves. So let me annotate again. So here you're seeing straight waves traveling in this direction on that side, and they're hitting this yellow wall, but there is a small opening. They don't show the reflective waves, by the way, because then it gets complicated, but there's a small opening in the wall. What happens is the waves actually, they start looking like circular ripples. I'm sorry, that meant to, meant to, that to be an arrow. And they, they actually bend around the corner, okay? So waves that are traveling 
you know, 100% to the right. Now they're traveling up and to the right and down and to the right. They look like circular waves, or at least part of a circular wave. And this phenomenon is called diffraction. And you spell it like, actually, let me clear these drawings. You spell it like this, okay, diffraction. So uh, sometimes we draw the picture of diffraction like this. They, they ask you to do this in your homework, by the way if you don't mind drawing a picture of diffracted waves. Okay, so let me erase this. Let's say here come your waves. Now I, I just erased it, but I'm gonna put it again. The separation of two crests would be a wavelength, right? Now the width of the opening, I'm gonna call W. And what happens is these straight waves spread out on the other side, okay? In this phenomenon called dis diffraction. Now, in order for diffraction to be noticeable, the wavelength has to be larger than the width of the slip, okay? So if you have ocean waves, which have really long wavelengths, then you have to, you can have an opening that's actually pretty big, to be honest with you, as long as the opening is smaller than the distance between the waves, okay? So if the wavelengths of the ocean waves are like 100 meters apart, then you're not gonna really notice any diffraction there. Uh, well, you could actually, but you just need uh, any opening will do it. That's less than hundred meters, if that makes sense. Okay, so the wavelength has to be bigger than the width of the slit. Now for light, that's extremely challenging to do. Okay, light has really small, small wavelengths, right? So you have to poke like a tiny pinhole in a piece of paper or something, and then you'll see the, the light does diffract around the pinhole, but even then, not very much. Now, sound waves have very long wavelengths, okay? In fact, certain sound waves, like low frequency sounds, will have very long wavelengths. Like in some cases, if you had a wavelength, if you had like, uh, let's say a sound wave, the lowest sound you can hear is around 20 hertz, okay? And, um, just to show you what kind of wavelength that would be, the speed of sound is around 343 meters per second. I'm gonna divide that by uh, 20 Hertz because wavelength is equal to the speed divided by F, right? And I get 17 meters. So very low frequency sound will diffract, diffract even around doorways and stuff like that. And that's why you can hear sound around the corner. So what I'm telling you is long wavelengths diffract more than short wavelengths. Now, for, for sound waves, long waves mean lower notes. So have you ever noticed when a car drives by and they're playing music in the car that you can hear the bass really well right through the walls of the car around the cracks and stuff like that in the window panes and in the doorways and stuff? Well, that's because the low frequency notes have very, very long wavelengths and they diffract really well. So they bend around the corner really well. Whereas really high frequency treble sounds can have wavelengths of less than a centimeter. And that means you would need like, you know, much smaller openings in order for you to hear, they don't diffract as much, let's put it that way, okay? You'd have to put your ear basically right up to the opening in order for you to hear the high frequency sounds. So that's why you hear bass notes Okay, around corners, et cetera. That, that explains it for you. Okay, so that phenomenon is called diffraction. All right, so we've looked at reflection, we've looked at diffraction. Now let's look at something that we, you're gonna look at in great detail in grade 12, uh, in grade 10. So I don't wanna like do too much of the grade 10 for you right here, but let me just introduce it for you. Refraction. Now refraction is most obvious to you with light, okay? When light enters or when waves enter a new medium, uh, if that medium has a different speed, so if it's slower, for example, like you're seeing in this picture right here, what happens is the waves change direction, okay? And they bend, like they, they change direction. Now you notice this with light, if you put like a straw in a glass cup or something and the straw appears bent, okay, in the water that it's an illusion and it's an illusion created by refraction, okay? Because the water is a slow medium for light. And when the light exits the water and goes into the air, it changes direction and the straw appears bent, even if it's perfectly straight. Okay, so let me show you here another picture of it here. 
okay, this is how it works with water waves. So here we see the waves bouncing off like as we did before. But down here at the bottom, you'll see the waves go through. So here they change direction, they bend, okay? And they bend actually towards the normal when they slow down, okay? So this phenomenon is called refraction. In grade 10, you will learn about this. Okay, so I, I really don't wanna waste your time. There's no homework on this, but you will learn that what's happening is you get partial reflection and partial transmission of the wave as we saw before. And I've called the uh, angle of refraction phi in this case. And there's this mathematical thing you learn about in grade 10. Please don't get stressed about it. It's not in your homework. I just wanted to mention it to you because it's kind of interesting. So there's a mathematical connection between the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. Okay, how much bending you get. And it depends on the differences in speed. Okay, so here the speed changes when you go from the top medium into the darker medium and the, the dark blue medium in the bottom. So when you go from gray to dark blue, okay, what's happening is you're slowing down the waves and the amount that you slow down will determine how much they bend. So that's the connection between the two angles. Anyway, that's it. Okay, don't worry about refraction. It's a property of waves, but we're not going to look at it in grade uh, um, nine. Okay, we'll look at that more in grade 10. So we'll save some things for your future. Okay, and that's one of them. Now, by the way, this happens with sound waves too. It happens when sound waves enter water or exit water, okay, or and go into the air, for example. Or it happens when sound waves uh, go from hot air to cold air. In fact, there was a battle in World War I or something where you had like one of those like sort of cool days in a valley where there was hot air at, at altitude and cold air in the valley. It happens in Ottawa all the time. And what happened was the sound of the enemy artillery, which they used to aim their, their, their return fire, if you like, uh, was changing direction because of refraction of sound in the air and the people were pointing their guns in the wrong direction and they lost the battle because of it because of refraction of sound waves all right i saved the best for last okay so now let's talk about interference interference is what happens when two waves pass through each other okay so pass through each other what happens when waves pass through one another and this is kind of cool. What happens if two crests are heading in opposite directions? What do they do? Okay, so take a look at this picture. So here comes two crests. And again, I'm going to get, change the view for you. There's a small one and a big one. Okay, the small one is moving um, from right to left. Okay, and the big one is moving from left to right. So here, let me annotate it for you. So the small one is moving that way. That is the small one. And the, the animation keeps resetting, okay? So that's why it looks a little confusing. The big one is moving that way. But what happens when they meet just for a second? Well, the small one is only about, here, let me see if I can do it. It's about that big, right? Small one, but the big one, it's about that big, it's taller wave. I'm a little bit off, but you, you get the idea. Now, what happens is where they meet at the middle, the wave goes way up to up here somewhere, okay? So just for an instant though, and so when the waves meet, they, they do pass through each other, but at the moment they pass through each other, the disturbance adds up, okay? And so let's say this was like, you know, one meter and this over here was 1.5 meters. Then what happens is when they add up, we get in here a 2.5 meter disturbance, which is the sum of their two amplitudes. Okay, and that's what happens when two crests meet. They interfere with each other, creating what's called a standing wave or a super crest. Okay, like, like superhero, right? It's a super crest. Um, and that super crest only appears for an instant and it doesn't appear to move left or right. Notice that? Like it just seems to appear in one spot and then disappear very quickly. 
but then the waves just keep going. Like, so the small wave still moves off to the left and the big one's still moving off to the right. They just keep going as if like they never met at all. So they actually pass through each other kind of like ghosts. But when these two ghosts intersect, their amplitudes add up and we get a super crest that appears just for an instant at the point of intersection. Okay, now I'm gonna clear these pictures and let's look at what happens now when instead of two crests meeting, what happens when a crest meets a trough? Well, here it's about to happen and there you go. Well, this kind of interference, this time they don't get any taller. It's a different kind of interference. So I'm gonna turn on my annotations again. So here we have two equally sized objects. We have a trough that's moving this way, right? We have a crest that's moving that way. And then they meet right about here. I'm gonna draw a blue dot where they meet. That is the point of intersection, I'll call it P, okay? Notice that the point P actually never moves. See that? It never moves. Watch again, that blue dot never actually moves. It's almost like for just an instant, the wave seems to disappear completely just for a split second, okay? But as they pass through each other at point P, crests and troughs cancel out. So point P is a stationary point. It stays stationary, okay? And here, I'm gonna actually write it in the margin. So here, P is stationary, okay? And a stationary point, okay? is called a node in wave terminology. Okay, so notice how point P doesn't move. So nodes don't move. Kind of cool, right? So this thing that we're looking at is called interference. What happens when two waves pass through each other? Now, in the case of a crest and a trough, you get what's called destructive interference. They don't have to cancel out completely, like these ones do, because they're the same size. If I had a bigger crest and a smaller trough, they wouldn't cancel completely, like the crest would win, but it would still get smaller, okay? And so we call this principle interference or the principle of superposition when the two waves meet and they either add up when they're both the same kind of wave. So for example, two crests would produce a super crest, two troughs produce a super trough, okay? But a crest and a trough, if they're the same size, they can produce a stationary point called a node, okay? All right, so we call this phenomenon interference. And like I said, I saved the best for last. So the waves add up, okay, if they're the same type, two crests, two troughs. This is also known as constructive interference, okay? So that's when you get two of the same type of waves, two crests or two troughs. However, when a crest meets a trough, Okay, if they're the same type, they get constructive interference, but if they're opposite types, they cancel. Okay, they partly or completely cancel. This is AKA destructive interference. Now notice the waves aren't destroyed. It's only that they just disappear at that point, P. Okay, but then they just keep going. They still pass through each other, but they cancel when they overlap, okay? So this is destructive interference. Only waves do this. It's kind of a, a unique property that's only true for waves, okay? Two baseballs don't do this. They don't sort of disappear or produce a super baseball and they don't pass through each other at all. They just bounce off. See, particles behave very differently from waves, okay? So here is an example. So before they meet, here we have crest A and crest B moving in opposite directions. Crest A is two meters high, crest B is four meters high, right? Now, at point P, which is the point where they meet, you're going to get a standing wave that appears for just a moment that's actually gonna be six meters high in total, so the sum of their two amplitudes. But then afterwards, okay, they're still there, they're just going about their way in opposite directions, right? B moving off to the left and A moving to the right all the time. And so that's what we see here in this picture here with the two crests, 
okay? They're moving in opposite directions. And when they meet just for an instant, you see a standing wave, okay? A super crest that appears and then very quickly disappears. All right, now, what would happen if we get wave after wave after wave traveling in opposite directions? Well, that produces a pattern of standing waves and this looks really cool, so watch. So here's wave after wave after wave heading in opposite directions. So here at the top, you see the two waves, okay? So here, let's call the top waves here A. Waves in A are moving that way and waves in B are moving that way. And when they overlap with each other, this is what you see, okay? So this is what you observe. So in other words, you're gonna see standing waves. Here you're seeing a super crest and then a super trough and then a super crest and then a super trough. So in other words, you're going to see alternating, okay, super crest, super trough, super crest, super trough, alternating. And what you're seeing in between those areas of constructive interference is right here, right here, right here, right here, right there, and right there, you're seeing a whole bunch of stationary points that are called nodes, right? These are all nodes. Now, in between the nodes, you're getting alternating super crests and super troughs, okay? Those are called anti-nodes, like literally the opposite of a node is an anti-node, right? Like I'm a genius and you guys are anti-geniuses, okay, if that makes sense, <laughs> okay? So anti means opposite. So here is your anti-nodes and the anti-nodes, you get lots of wave action, constructive and constructive interference all the time on the anti-nodes, but on the nodes, you're getting destructive interference all the time. Now, because the nodes have like either a crest or a trough in between them, that's half of a wavelength. So node to node, this distance here is one half of a wavelength, okay? Now I'm gonna write all this again a little bit later, but I just wanted to show you the animated picture is better than still pictures, right? So here I'm showing you these animations to help you understand it. Now I'm gonna clear all these drawings, okay? So we call that, whoops, let me clear it again. We call this an interference pattern, okay? And you get constructive and destructive interference. This is how we draw it, okay? So normally when we're drawing them by hand, we draw them like this. So these points here are your nodes and nodes are half of a wavelength from node to node, half of a wavelength apart. And these are called this is what we call an interference pattern. So these are periodic waves moving in opposite directions. And we don't see the, the waves moving in opposite directions, but instead we see this, we see standing waves, super crests, super troughs and nodes, right? That's what we see. Now, the way you draw these things, I mean, let me show you how you draw them by hand because you're gonna have to draw them sometimes, okay? You would go like this. First you draw, you know, something like that. Okay, now that represents this wave here. Okay, and I'm just reproducing it with my hand. Then when I draw its opposite, I'll use a different color. Now you draw the opposite. So instead of starting with a crest, we start with a trough. Okay, and then you just do the opposite phase. Okay, opposite phase. So here we see, I'm, I did not a great job drawing it, but what I'm trying to do is re reproduce this picture and show you how you draw them. Here we have two nodes and three anti-nodes like that, okay? And that's it. So we call this a standing wave pattern. Now, interference sometimes happens in solid structures, okay? Watch this. You're not even gonna believe me on this one, okay? There's a famous bridge in the United States called the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Now, this is not computer animation and that is not a small scale object. That is an actual bridge that cars drive across. In fact, if you look very carefully, there is a car on this bridge. I'm going to point it out to you. You have to see it. I have to turn on my annotations. Um, it's right 
there. Okay, see, you just catch a glimpse. There's a car right there. And there is a, an occupant in the car. There was a man and there's also a dog, okay? Now this bridge is in Seattle, uh, Washington. So it's like, it's near Seattle in this small town called, uh, in, in Washington, Washington state, okay? Like in the West, not Washington city, not the capital, okay? Not Washington DC, but the state of Washington. It's on the West coast. And this is called the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Okay, now I am just, my, my diagram is moving on me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clear these annotations and I'm gonna go back to this and I'm also going to change the layout of this picture a little. Okay, so that is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge and I'm not even joking. There's maybe a 50 kilometer per hour wind this day. So it's a bit blustery, but you know, you can see the trees blowing in the wind, nothing too strong, not like hurricane force winds, but that is an interference pattern. What you're seeing is standing waves, super crest, super trough. And there's a node, okay? I'll show you where the node is. The node is, I don't know if these, I'm hoping these animate, you're seeing the annotations. There's a node right there. That's not moving very much, okay? And here you're seeing the two anti-nodes. So anyway, that is an interference pattern, okay? Now this is undesirable. We don't like our buildings to do that. So now let's take a look at another picture of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So here's the man running away from his car. And by the way, you don't see his car anymore. It's now sunk. The whole bridge collapses here. Look at that. Okay. So that's some kind of professor. I, I, he wasn't studying anything. He just, he was driving across and he had to stop driving because the bridge was wildly rotating like that. And then there it goes, his dog sadly didn't make it. Now in his defense, he tried to get the dog out of the car. Okay, in case you think he's a callous man that doesn't care about his dog. He tried to get the dog out and the dog was freaking out in the car and was biting him like it would not come out. Now, I understand this because my dog, when she gets scared, she'll do this, she'll freeze and you cannot command her to come, she will not come. The only way for me to get her to come is to actually physically like grab her. She will resist. And apparently the dog bit him. Okay. And just did not want to do that. Did not want to leave. And unfortunately the dog died as a result. Now he didn't have much time. He just barely made it. Like he literally just barely made it off the bridge before it collapsed. So, uh, I mean, you know, he did the right thing. If he had tried longer to save the dog, he would have died too. Okay, I think actually, no, you can't really see the car at all, but it's it's gone down below visible sight here. I've got another image of it for you. So here is the uh, view with the, with the car there. This is the color images have been colorized. Okay, the original footage was black and white. You can see that this is a vintage car, like it's quite old. I think it was back in the 1940s or 50s or something like that. So there you can see that old style car uh, and look at that. I mean, it just, the, the bridge almost looks like it's made of rubber. That's, it's hard to believe that that's concrete and asphalt, but it is. Okay. Now, is it, was it the fault of the engineers that we had these, they're called resonant vibrations in the Tacoma Narrows bridge? Was that the engineer's fault? They just didn't design it well. Well, you know, it's really amazing that it turned out this way because I don't think they could have done this if they tried to do it. In other words, sometimes you something happens by accident that if you, that was your intention was to build it this way, uh, it would have been almost impossible for them to get it right. But just by chance, they made this almost this bridge almost like a musical instrument, like the wind blew over it and it started to resonate kind of like the way a reed resonates in a wind instrument that has a reed in it. Okay, anyway, so that's the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And here you can see the various views of uh, the, the demise of the dog. The dog is in the car, FYI, okay? And the man walked out along the center span, okay? Just down the, down the middle of the road where it's not too uh, crazy there, the wave action. But wow, look at those super crests, right? Followed by a super trough. That is a standing wave pattern, pretty cool. The Tacoma Narrows bridge collapse. True story. That's not computer animation. Although the color has been added artificially, it is still uh, 
you know, to this day, one of the most spectacular sort of failures ever caught on film. All right, so now let's look at the last thing in this, and it's a little worksheet. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You'll need to print this out, okay, in order to do it. And so let me explain what you're supposed to do. All right, so here you have, what they want you to do is use the principle of superposition. You know how you add up waves? And I want you to like draw the resulting wave. So let me show you what they're doing here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use different colors. So I'm gonna color the equilibrium line. I'm gonna color it blue. Okay, now in the first example, in example A, we have a red crest that's shaped like a square. And I know it's shaped like a square, trust me. We're making the squares easier for you to, because it's easier to draw a square than it is to draw the waves, okay? So picture a square wave, okay? And another wave, I'm gonna color it green. So here's our other crest. Now one is smaller and one is bigger. In fact, here my green crest is four units high, okay? And it's four units wide, but my small red guy is two units high and two units wide, okay? Now, when they overlap, and right now they're overlapping, they're gonna add up, right? So I'm gonna use a rainbow color to show you what they look like when they add up. So here, I'm gonna draw my rainbow just outside the green line. Here at first, my rainbow is going to just follow my green wave because the red one's not overlapping it yet. But here where they overlap, four plus two, so remember, the green guy is four units high, but the red one is two units high. Four plus two is six. And so what happens is when the red wave overlaps, it's gonna add to the green wave and make a little super crest right there at the point where they overlap. Okay, and that overlapped wave will be six squares high, the sum of the green and the red, okay, is six squares. And then over here, we only have green wave. So there's no red wave overlapping. So it just goes back to the green wave. And there you go. So what we did was we draw the superimposed wave, okay, which is the rainbow color here. And that's what it looks like. Now I'm gonna do the same thing in the second picture. So here I have my green wave. Again, it's a four by four green wave. And again, I have a two by two red wave, but this time it's a trough and not a crest because it's below my equilibrium line, okay? Well, what's gonna happen this time? Well, this one is negative two and the green one is positive four, okay? So what happens is my rainbow wave, which is the overlap of the two waves, at first it just matches the green one like before because there's nothing overlapping it here in this first column. But now where they overlap, the red wave is gonna subtract two, four minus two, is positive two. So what's gonna happen is the, the red trough is gonna take a bite out of the green wave where it overlaps. So it takes this bite out of it that you see right here, okay? And so what they're asking you to do is to draw the rainbow wave, which is the sum of the two waves you're looking at, okay? So here, look at this one. Here's my red trough. And here's my green crest. This time they look like sort of like Tetris blocks, <laughs> okay? Anyway, um, look, on the first column, in column number one, the red one is negative four and the green one is positive four. So what's negative four and positive four? Well, zero, right? Now, if we go to column number two, my green one is positive one and my red one is negative one. So what's negative one and positive one? Well, again, zero. And in fact, that trend is gonna continue for the next three squares. So the sum of two identical sort of mirror image crest and trough is just zero all the time. So my rainbow is just gonna look like a horizontal line. These are gonna cancel each other out completely. All right, now that I've shown you that, I'm gonna let you do the rest. There's a couple more there for you. The last one's a bit tricky. Let me just highlight for you where, the, where everything is. So here we have a green crest 
and we have our red trough down here. So add them together. And over here, we have a triangular shape crest like this, and also another triangular shape crest like that. Okay, and what does it look like when they're overlapping like this? Okay, so you give that a shot, you add them up. Okay, where they overlap, you add them up. All right, so now there is this one down here in the next question, I'm gonna help you do it a little bit. So now they're gonna to try to get you to animate the waves, okay? So let's pretend they're moving, which waves do, they don't just stand still. So here's a red box and a green box. And it says that the both are traveling at one square per second, one square per second. So here, we, these are not seconds along the bottom, they're just counting the squares. So I start at square zero and then my green box goes up to square four and my red box is at, starts at square seven and goes up to square nine, okay? Now, after two seconds, my green one will have moved and now it's moved two units over, whoops, green. And so now my green box is the four by four is right here. So that's after two seconds. But my red one has also moved and it's moving the opposite way. So instead of starting at seven, it's gonna start at five. So that means my red box has moved and now it's here. So now we've got some overlap, right? So I've got two crests. This one has a height of two and the green one has a height of four. Well, what's four plus two? Well, it's six, of course. So my purple or my sorry my rainbow overlap wave my standing wave or whatever is going to look like this four plus two is six but then it's going to quickly drop down and match the red wave over here and so for a moment my rainbow wave which is the overlap of the two waves looks like that okay so where they overlap they add up and that's what you get now it says after four seconds. Well, after four seconds, my box has gonna be now at the four meter mark, if you like. So my box, my big box is gonna be over here between four and eight. And my red box, it is also gonna move another two over. So now it's at five, uh, or sorry, not at five. Um, it's gonna move over to three. So it's gonna be here. Okay, so now they're moving through each other, right? Now again, they have one column where they overlap. So here is where the two things overlap and four plus two is six. So the overlapped waves will look like this rainbow wave here that I'm about to draw. It's gonna go up to six over like that. Then down, it's gonna match the green box after that and go down like this, okay? So anyway, that's it. I will let you do the last one. Okay, so that is up to you. It's really easy. I say do the last one. Okay, now there's a little game here at the bottom. What you're supposed to do, and I will do the first one with you, is you're supposed to add the blue and red waves and then write the sum of them down below. Okay, so let me show you how you do that. I'm gonna number these columns. One, two, three, and four, okay? And here my blue wave, has a height of plus one. And my red wave down here, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's minus seven, minus because it's below the equilibrium line, which is this dark line that you see here is the equilibrium line, right? So do it one column at a time. So down below here, I'm gonna write the columns out, okay? One, two, three, and four. So these are my four columns. Now, uh, what's negative seven? So this negative seven plus one in column number one. Well, negative seven plus one is negative six. So I'm gonna draw my rainbow wave down here. The first column, it's negative six. I'm gonna go down here like that, that's negative six. Now my next column is negative four for the red one and positive one for the uh, blue wave at the top. So negative four plus one is negative three. So all of a sudden my wave is gonna go, whoops, 
it's going to go from negative six down to negative three, which is right here. Okay. And then in column two, it's going to be negative three. And then I noticed that that's going to stay that way for columns three and four. So it's going to go like this. And then you're going to drop back to zero. Okay. Now, if I color this wave in, what letter of the alphabet does that look like to you? Okay, well, it looks like the letter P. And it's a riddle. What's green and fuzzy, and if it fell out of a tree, it would kill you. All right. Do the rest of the superposition. So, like, add up these waves in the space below, okay, like I did with the letter P, and you'll have the answer. Okay? So, what's green and fuzzy, and if it fell out of a tree, it will kill you. Well, uh, the, the suspense is killing me, but I think you'll like the answer. Okay. It's so true. You'll wonder why you didn't think of it yourself. Okay. So anyway, figure it out and, uh, you know, see what the answer is. Okay. And that's it for the homework. So that, that, I mean, that's it for part of it. So let me go to the homework outline and let me explain what I'd like you to do here. Okay. So I would like you to do now at this point for homework, page... 218, number one through six. So that's part of it. Also, these two pages here. Okay. But do the first worksheet that I just gave you, but not this one. Okay. So we're going to cut it off right here. Okay. And then the next day, we'll do the resonance and string worksheet and the summary that we're looking at. So let's cut it off here. Please do not do this one yet, okay? Not Tuesday night, don't do it, okay? Just do the homework that you see, this homework here, up to the red line. So that's day two homework, okay? All right, well, that's good enough. I know I took a long time. I really had to explain the whole boundary thing. And the rest of the lesson was a lot faster. So that, that's it, guys. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge. I think that's pretty cool. And I, this is exciting. On Wednesday, I have the best demonstration you'll ever see. You're going to love it. So I'm looking forward to showing it to you. And it has to do with this topic of interference. So I think you'll like it. And I'm going to end it there. Have a good day. And I will talk to you soon. Okay. Bye, guys.